Hi, everybody. Thanks for staying for our second plenary talk of the conference. I'm very happy to have you. I'm burning. Please, for those of you in the back, come here because it feels very lonely and weird. So it would be nice if some people that are standing could come and sit around here. Um, so first we are going to have a few words by Rob Scheimer. So uh, Eric, Eric Hurst, who introduced Nick Bloom yesterday, said that he didn't know why he'd been picked to introduce Nick. I think I know why I was, was asked to introduce Sivan. Um, he's somebody who I've known for a long time. I've known since he was a graduate student at Chicago. And uh, I've had the privilege of working with him on a couple of papers. Uh, but I, I want to come back and talk a, a bit uh, about Ivan and our interactions in a moment. Uh, but I've also spent some time, uh, since I was asked, asking people, you know, sort of basic rules, like what should you say when you introduce somebody, much like Eric was asking those questions. So the first thing I said is, you know, don't curse, so I won't do that. And then they, they told me not to cry. Uh, <laughs> and then um, there's some videos of Yvonne at uh, Ricardo Lagos's bachelor party that they said I wasn't supposed to show. So I won't show those. Uh, so uh, what I can do is I, I, I can talk about you know, when, I, when I first met Ivan, uh, the type of work that he's done, and, and I think what makes him remarkable. Uh, I, I met him. I got an email from this guy. You get emails from people. They write to you and say, I think there's a mistake in your paper. And it, I don't know. More often than not, you wind up going through and finding out why there wasn't a mistake in your paper. You just didn't explain things very well. And I was sure this guy was wrong, but said that you have a conjecture in your paper that's, um, that's not true. And we'd spent so long, it was a paper with Darren Asimogu, and we'd spent a long time trying to come up with the counterexamples of the conjecture. And Yvonne just gave us a beautiful counterexample to our conjecture. Uh, and so I was very impressed that, you know, not just that he'd come up with a counterexample, but also the elegance of the counterexample and feeling very stupid that we hadn't come up with that counterexample before and realized that our, our conjecture was wrong. Uh, and that sort of set the tone of a lot of the interactions that I've, I've had with Ivan. Uh, he's worked in a number of areas. I think his, you know, maybe best known work is in a wide variety of topics in public finance. And I think today's talk is going to touch on, uh, on some of those issues on optimal taxation of labor income, optimal taxation of capital income, optimal taxation of estates. Uh, and He's also worked in, uh, uh, with me, he's worked on unemployment insurance. He's done his own work on, on unemployment insurance. He's worked on optimal monetary and fiscal policy in open economies and in, in, uh, in closed economies on, on currency crises. Uh, so he's worked in a, in a huge number of, of areas. There's other people who have worked in those areas. Um, what, he, what I think makes his work different is in the way that he uses models, which I don't think there's anyone else who uses them in the, in the same way. There's sometimes you read a, a theory paper, you get, uh, get a couple different reactions to it. Sometimes I read a, th a theory paper, and I feel like the author is just trying to bludgeon me with theory and show that they know how to write down Bellman equations and, and so on, which is nice, but um, doesn't, doesn't get you too far. Or sometimes I read theory papers, and I think that the, what they're doing is kind of adding lots of equations to sneak in the assumption that they really needed and obscure it in the math rather than highlight it. And what Ivan is, is I, I think, remarkable at, and I think we'll, I'm sure will come through in the talk today, uh, is the way that he uses math to illuminate key ideas in economics. Uh, and you know, using math really as a, as a language that makes the ideas transparent. Uh, so I'm looking forward to learning more, I guess, about optimal wealth taxation today from Ivan Werney. Thank you. I just remember that email and that I was impressed that Rob replied um, at all. And I never got a response from Daron. <laughs> um, still haven't got a response. But um, I'm so happy to be here and get to talk about this uh, wealth taxation, which is something I worked on for a long time and I think is sort of an opportune time now with all the interest peaked from maybe the uh, Piketty mania. Uh, I don't know if 
uh, Piketty Mani is widespread here at the SED, but um, but in any case, um, <clears throat> there's you know we all know the trends that people are talking about and the concerns uh, where inequality is going, perhaps, um, and uh, what that means for what we should do about uh, wealth taxation. And that's the question I want to address today. Exactly, should we be thinking about wealth taxes, and if so, to what extent we should be uh, thinking about them progressively? And uh, what I want to do is see to what extent theory can help us uh, think about this question, and um, and you know maybe narrow down the options or, 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 or guide us to what things we should be thinking empirically to, to, to sort out this this question. I'm going to try and go through the theories, some old, some 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 things I've worked on, and uh, in particular, sort of separate this dichotomy between theories that start with sort of old money, so to speak, people who have inherited, and theories that uh, are about maybe new money, new wealth uh, saved from from earnings. And there's a bunch of theories that Im imply that, that we should not be taxing, and I'm going to review those. Both for old money, I would put Chamley Judd there, and for uh, new money, I guess in Stiglitz. And then there's a bunch of theories out there with uh, some some imperfection, some idiosyncratic uncertainty, or somewhat that uh, would derive uh, positive taxes. But I'm going to kind of set those aside because I, I really want to focus on on taxation of the very wealthy, and for those maybe these precautionary motives are not uh, the first order issue. So I'm going to focus on redistributional issues, and in particular from the top wealth. So today I want to review these uh, previous arguments and, and consider some new ideas. Okay, so let me start with these uh, models that are based on uh, old money, so to speak. So I think Chamley Judd falls right in there because the, the, the whole focus in that model, and this is a sort of a meat and potatoes for a lot of people, Chamley Judd, that's why I went back to this, to preparing this talk, and then I found I had a lot to say. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it really starts with some given initial wealth, in the hands of some people, and, and that's the, the start, and we have to think of what to do. We would like to expropriate it maybe, but we can't, so should we be taxing it? That's distortive. Um, the surprising thing is that in the long run, it should not be taxed in those models. Today, I want to reassess these results and show that to some extent, those conclusions are not warranted even in those models. And um, so let me start with Judd. Judd is nice because redistribution is like the first word in the title, Heterogeneity is there. In fact, it's a very Marxist-inspired uh, setup. There's capitalists and there's workers. Capitalists save and supply labor, and they live off their rents. And workers, they supply labor and just barely make it, uh, eating hand to mouth. And there's some initial wealth that's given. And the goal is to redistribute to workers. So there's no doubt policy is going to be decided to uh, help workers. And the taxes available are taxes on capital, and the revenue is rebated to workers. And on top of all of these assumptions, he even works with uh, budget balance. So you can't hardly imagine that taxes aren't going to be used in the long run uh, uh, in a setting like this. The surprising thing is he finds that, that, that it should not. The difference with Chamley, I want to stress that this is not so properly understood, is Chamley assumes that there are government bonds and Judd uh, does not. So uh, Judd assumes uh, budget balance. As a result of that, the consumption of the workers, basically all the available output, minus what is given to, uh, to capitalists. So the main result in Judd is uh, if the allocation converges and if the multipliers of the, the, up, the, the planning problem converge, then the tax on capital is zero. So there are two questions that arise implying this theorem and thinking whether it's relevant. The first is, do the multipliers converge? Why would they have to converge? The allocation might converge, but maybe the multipliers don't. That's, a, that's, a, that's an issue. The other is, does the allocation actually converge? And we're used to taking that for granted because it seems, you know, it's a neoclassical growth model. Yes, there's a second best problem on top of that, but we expect it to converge. Okay, so there's a nice little example that already exists in the literature, which is on a log utility. Um, it's, it's due to Lansing. And uh, basically, if capitalists have log utility and they are saving uh, with log utility, they're going to save by a constant fraction. So we know that there will be a constant savings rate, S, which will equal their discount factor, beta. As a result, the planning problem from the point of view of the government and the workers, they're working together, remember, is, is the following. It's, it's, it's very simple. It's as if they had available the, the technology to, to save, 
but at a different price. So basically, the idea is if, if we want to invest, we have to give cap capitalists more resources. Unfortunately, for every dollar we give them, they're going to consume one minus s of that. Um, so they're only going to invest s. Therefore, if we want to invest one unit of capital, we need to hand them one over s uh, units. And so it's, it makes capital more costly from the point of view of the government. So the model is very simple. This is an uh, optimal growth model except for that. And we know that we're going to converge to a steady state monotonically, et cetera, et cetera. And at that steady state, the, the social rate of return, the technological rate of return on capital will equal um, the one over beta, the return that, that workers perceive, which is the true return times S. That means the, the, the technological rate of return is equal to one over beta S. And the return that the, the capitalists have to be getting is one over beta because they're at a steady state. Okay? So when you put the two things together, that implies that the tax rate on capital is positive and equal to it, and and actually quite large. It's you know R star over R is one over beta, which means if you put beta for a year 0.95 around there, you're going to get a tax rate of around five percent, five percent on wealth every year. Okay, that's beyond Piketty's wildest dreams, um, and and just simply out of this model. So. This is a well-known example. In fact, the solution here is time consistent. It converges to a steady state. So what went wrong with Judd's theorem? Well, the multipliers diverged, and this is an example due to Lansing. The thing is, this example is considered a knife-edge case, like log is a knife-edge case, and, and no real economic uh, consequences were taken from this, this paper. Okay? Instead, I'm going to show that that's not the case. So um, let's do sigma greater than 1. I have a result here that says that, uh, well, if sigma is greater than 1 and you're maximizing the utility of the worker, the solution just cannot converge to the zero tax uh, steady state. It goes somewhere else. It, it, Judd's result is correct. It will not, in this case, converge anywhere else in the interior of, of or it, it might either cycle or converge to, to zero or something. In fact, it converges to zero. So I'll show you the solution here. Um, this is the path of capital over time for different values of sigma. So you could focus on one of them. The bottom one that's going towards zero is for sigma 1.1. Okay? And this is done over a period of 300 years here. And uh, if you choose sigma uh, below one, then you do uh, converge eventually to the, to the just steady state with zero capital taxes. So this, the, the simulated path is done so that you start at zero taxes, then you solve the optimal planning problem. And, uh, and here you see the capital drops very quickly somewhere, and then it either goes back up very slowly to the zero tax uh, steady state, or it, or it eventually comes down. And if you pick sigma very close to one, it kind of stays very constant, which is not all surprising, because basically, for sigma very close to one, the, the time path should look a lot like the time path that you found in, in the log case, which has the property that you converge, as in the neoclassical growth model, quite quickly, you know, maybe a half-life of 10 years, to the steady state, and the steady state was was way down there. So actually, where all these curves are going after 20 years, more or less, is this log steady state. Okay. So what I want to get out of this picture is that actually, it's not true that, that in the long run, capital uh, taxation would be zero in this model. In this model, capital taxes uh, would be positive. And in fact, um, for sigma gray one, here's the plot for taxes, they would blow up. Okay. So this is a peculiar property of this model. And, but for, for other values, it'll stay very constant. Even for cases where you do converge back to the steady state, it takes 300 years. So I'm not sure what, what we should make of that. Okay? So even after, uh, you know, after 100 years, all tax rates are higher than 1% of wealth, which is basically you know, what some people are asking for a progressive tax. So um, the model is not really screaming out not to tax capital, I would say. So not to be surprised, the solution paths, we should have thought of this, have to be continuous once we saw that log case. It's not knife edge in that sense. Um, why does the solution diverge sometimes? I mean, why does it go to zero instead of the, the zero capital safe state? The intuition is something like, if you increased future taxes, then with sigma greater than one, the, the capitalists are going to be worried about their consumption in the future. So they're going to save even more now. Uh, and you were taxing capital, so that's good. Your, your tax base is going to go up. Okay? The reverse is true when uh, sigma is less than 1. So the reason why you might converge, the reason why you do get the Judd result when sigma is less than 1, remember, you don't get it with sigma equal to 1 either, 
is that uh, you want to manipulate the future taxes to increase the tax base today. So there you lower taxes in the future. You promise you're lowering them in the future so that uh, entrepreneurs, uh, capitalists save more and uh, you get a higher tax base. So another thing to stress is the only reason we're going back there is because we're taxing in the short and medium run. Okay? The only reason we're making these future promises is because we're taxing. So let me move on to Chamley and try and take what I think is really the message in Chamley. Uh, I'll do a version with heterogeneity, which is based on a paper of mine, um, but, but things would probably be similar with his representative agent model. And I'm going to, basically, it's adding bonds to the Judd model so that things are quite similar. Um, and you could consider two cases, one where workers cannot save, uh, which is in line with a Judd assumption, and the other where workers can save just as well as capitalists, which is the actual assumption Chamley works with. Um, but I'll consider both. And in this case, um, it's very well known that the solution is, you know, you want to tax as high as you can in the short run, okay? And expropriate if you could, that would be ideal. And then the government should, with all those resources they get in the short run, uh, accumulate wealth in the economy and basically either lend out or, or hold, uh, hold the S&P 500 or something. So there's a question of how reasonable this is. I mean, last time the U.S. was about to have uh, surpluses and, and thinking about going into negative debt, people got worried. Um, so there's, there's some issues here. But let's, you know, Chamley wasn't also interested in this case of expropriation, so he wanted to impose con constraints on, 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 on taxation. One way to do that would just to say, okay, you can't expropriate the stock at time zero, but you can choose the tax rates from there on out because those will be expected. If you do that, that's a problem, and I show here, because if sigma is greater than one, you would still be able to expropriate capitalists by, by just manipulating that future uh, tax rate. By, by choosing an infinite tax rate, expropriating them tomorrow, they're so desperate that they're even going to save more. So you, you basically, they don't have a party trying to avoid the tax. They really go in, go in all, all into it and, and pay you a lot of taxes. And the other problem is, we were talking about a period where there won't be a tax. Well, as you, what's a period? As you shrink the time horizon, you would also get this full expropriation as a limit. So there's a bit of a problem. That's why Chamley was smart. He thought, okay, I'm just going to put a maximum tax rate each period. Okay? And then he proved a nice result. He said, okay, I'm going to assume you can't tax the stock. You can tax net returns, and you can tax them at 100%. I think that one he just chose arbitrarily to pick one. Okay? And then he showed that you're gonna, the, the tax rate's going to be positive at the supper bound for a while, and then it's going to go back to zero. Okay? I'm going to show you that result is extremely sensitive. So pick any bound that's not 100%. Um, uh, tau bar. And suppose workers cannot save. I'll do the other case in a second. Then if sigma is greater than 1, um, the, tax, the tax would remain at the upper bound forever. Okay? So it's only when you get the sigma equal to 1 that maybe that doesn't hold true. If workers can save, which is actually the model he looked at, okay, then kind of keeping taxes on for a long time has an added cost because workers now get their choices distorted. And you don't like that because you're trying to help the workers out. Um, so in that case, I have the following result, which also gives you conditions for uh, keeping the tax at the upper bound forever, which is sigma grain of 1. And the, uh, this upper bound on taxes being less than this number. And this number here um, approaches 1 as sigma goes Go, uh, grows uh, to infinity. And it's also larger if wealth concentration is higher. So capital K is total capital, and lower K is capital in, in the hand of, of, of capitalists. So what we learn is, actually, for a very high tax rate, you might end up taxing forever in the Chamley model. Okay? Even if the highest tax rate you have is 35% corporate, you know, then oh, you might as well tax forever in that model. Okay? And if it's higher than that uh, as well. So to sum up, what I think the true message from Chamley is, is without constraints, we actually want to tax a huge amount. We accumulate assets. And there's a question of whether this is realistic. I said it before. Let me elaborate on a separate dimension, which might be questionable. What basically you do is you expropriate capital, and then you turn around and you lend to those capitalists so that they can stay in business. And, you know, we've been working for a few years now, especially on models with financial frictions, where it's not a good idea to, to have a high leverage uh, in terms of uh, you know, the people owning, uh, managing capital, and it's good to have instead skin in the game to have them be, uh, have a stake in, in, in the enterprise. So you know, there's another side to that. Then, of course, there might be the political economy of having a government accumulate so much assets. 
So then we want to put constraints, and if we put constraints, then actually taxes might be positive in the steady state. So I review these two models, and I actually don't find uh, those conclusions to be so uh, strong. Okay, so let me try and figure out also, get to the bottom of where this result comes from. So let me, or still in this Judd 2 class economy, let me postulate an arbitrary savings function. So savings is going to be a function of wealth today and the whole path of future interest rates. So this can handle any optimized utility functions uh, savings uh, with recursive util forward-looking utility. Um, it could handle um, those Zawa preferences or Koopmans or, or the, the additive preferences we've been talking about. And then I'm going to solve this problem maximizing utility subject to that savings rule. I'm going to look for a steady state. So what I did is I take the first order conditions of that problem and I impose a steady state, very similar methodology to Judd. And I get the following... Uh, tax formula. The tax on capital, which is the left-hand side, equals this formula on the right-hand side. And uh, I want you to ignore the RSI, that's R times the, the partial of the savings function with respect to income. That's going to be a steady state one, okay, typically. So in the, in the additive case, it's one. So put a one there. The, the important term is in the denominator is that infinite sum. Okay, it's an infinite sum of elasticities. So this is an inverse elasticity rule for Chamley Judd. Okay, and what it's saying is you got to take a whole sum of elasticities to compute this at a steady state. It's going to satisfy this, and the, each one of these elasticities is the elasticity of saving with respect to a future interest rate. Okay, and you're adding up over over very very long interest rates. So the the logic of this is the following: if you're at a steady state, you could promise to change the taxes 100 years from now. No, better 200 years, really far in the future, and only that tax rate. What effect is that going to have? Well, 199 years from now, it's going to probably increase savings quite a bit, or you know, depending on sigma greater or less than one, change savings quite a bit. Two years before that, not that much, and, and today, maybe not that much. So this sum seems to have a chance to converge, right? But the thing is, you're also blowing up the terms uh, with the beta to the minus tau, the terms that are, that are closer to the present. And the reason for that is you care more about changing savings today because you're going to get a value today. Okay? So the bottom line is the reason in Chapman Judd that you get a, a zero tax in the limit when you do get it, when this mis formula isn't misleading, is that um, this elasticity is infinity. Okay? And with constant relative risk conversions, you can show that actually the elasticity would have been declining by beta. You're canceling that, so you're getting a constant term, and that's why it's blowing up to infinity and then that's why you're getting a zero tax rate. So Chamley Judd were really careful because they probably got critiqued. Oh, you assume additive separable utility. We know that has infinite elasticity in the long run. They, they use Coop Manzusawa to say that's not it. But there is really an infinite elasticity lying lurking there. It has to do with an infinite elasticity of this net present value response of savings to a very far out interest rate. And now we can think a little more behaviorally what we think about that assumption. OK, to sum up, Judd when it does converge, it's extremely slow. I don't think it, it doesn't seem very relevant, okay, even in the cases it does converge. And it might even, not even converge to zero, so we might get a constant tax, very high, 5%, or even increasing tax rates. Chamley, we should, we should basically expropriate capital and, 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 and take, have the government invest in the economy. Not the typical thing you hear from people you know, trying to defend zero taxes. Okay? Um, and if instead we pose a, 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 a we bound the, the tax rate, we might want to hit that bound forever. So I'm not seeing the case for zero taxation here. On top of all this, of course, there's the time and consistency issue I'll get back to later. Okay, now let me still use Judd's model, now that we know it's not about zero taxes, to think about um, th this idea in Piketty about R minus G. So let me take a special case of this Judd uh, economy with capitalists and workers. And imagine linear technology uh, for capital and labor. So I'll, I'll fix the rate of return to capital and I'll fix the wage. And I'll assume the wage is growing exogenously uh, due to technology at rate G. And let's take the log case for capitalists. So they save a constant rate. And let's assume they save enough that we could get this economy growing or at least staying where it is. And workers also have log utility. How should the tax then vary with R and G? Here's the answer. If, if you were in this knife edge case where beta times R times S is equal to G, uh, you might want to think of the case of G equal to 1 first. 
then basically the, the, the workers are indifferent to saving at the margin, and they're happy to stay where they are in terms of the, the capital stock. So you're just going to stay there, and, and when, the, when G is positive, actually, you're going to you know, have capital growing at that same rate. And the tax rate then will be constant at the same rate we found before in the steady state, 1 minus beta, so around 5%. If instead beta times R times S is greater than G, then that indicates that this rate of return that we can get through capitalists is, is higher than, than, than the rate of growth. And as a result, we're going to kind of take off on an AK growth uh, path and eventually be on a balanced growth path in, in those terms. And in the long run, then, the tax will also converge to 1 minus beta. It won't be constant, but eventually it will be constant at 1 minus beta. So it will be independent of R, G, and S. So in this region, the tax rate doesn't respond to R, G, and S, even though inequality before tax does. Okay? And finally, there's another region. If, if beta times R times S is, is too low relative to G, then this technology is not a good deal for, for the worker government. Uh, and, and basically, they want to drive it down. It's like a, you know, a tree that's not growing enough. You cut it down. Okay? And so you basically eventually expropriate capital. So in that case, taxes are, are high and eventually exp they expropriate, inequality is extinguished, okay? But, you know, obviously we prefer to be in the first, in the second case than in the third, okay? So we're happier if R and S are high and there's growing inequality it, than, than in this other case. Um, but overall here, tax rates are decreasing because in one region they're insensitive to R over G. They depend just on R over G. That's a sufficient statistic for this long-run tax. But if R over G falls enough, then actually we should tax more. So it goes the opposite direction. So I'll come back. There will be a case that's a little, uh, this R minus G is going to make a comeback at the end of my talk. So now let me move to models of new money. So guys who made it and then save and become rich. So what do we think about that? Okay. So non-inherited wealth, saved from labor earnings. Should we tax that? Um, so one issue we've got to confront is that new money is going to turn into old money through inheritances. So how do we want to think about inheritances? Okay. And maybe it's going to be the same logic then as old money eventually, or maybe it's sort of the logic of new money because at the beginning, I don't know, maybe it's a mix, but actually it's going to be completely different because now it, we're going to be in a situation where, yeah, we're going to end up with old money, but we can prepare for it. And you'll see what I mean. We can do something exempted to prepare for that. So the key question here is if you want to think about an intergenerational environment is how you, uh, what you think about is efficiency. In general, you want to think of what, what, how you treat different generations. And uh, I want to argue we want to put some weight on future generations in general. The first reason is that's more general. We should map out all the, the, the Pareto frontier. The second reason I think very persuasive is we know that if we don't, don't do that, there are some surprising results like this immiseration results that we would drive everyone to consume zero, inequality would explode, and average utility would be very low. So, um, so I want to think here of, of a frontier between the way we put on the, uh, on the parents and the children, where the children I'm thinking of expected utility, that's a way of capturing that I care about equality of opportunity for, for children. We care about having equi equality for, for children. So I'm going to adopt, I'll show you the basic model that I set out with Emmanuel um, to think about this, which is, you know, parents have this utility function. They, they live only one period at time zero, and they consume and work. And children, they, uh, they only consume in, in, in period one. Okay. I wrote this paper after my first son was born, so I thought that was very realistic. Um, and, and we want this to be, you know, the second best problem. So labor is going to be provided... Uh, but there's some private information regarding productivity. So it's a Merlesian setup. Observable to the government is the kind of things we see in the real world. They're taxed, you know, earnings, output, uh, and bequests or consumption. And I want to ask in this setup, what's the best tax system? And to do that, in the, in, implicitly we're going to be confronting this trade-off between providing good incentives to parents and providing insurance or uh, equality of opportunity for the next generation. So let's look first at the solution that just cares about the parents. So if we only put weight on the parents, then there's a famous result by Atkins and Stiglitz that would apply here, and we should not be taxing bequests. Okay? With separable preferences, that's because we have separable preferences here, and we're allowing a nonlinear tax schedule. I always say the proper interpretation of this is 
If you've optimized the nonlinear tax schedule, then there's no room for a tax on, on capital. If obviously maybe you know you're not touching the nonlinear tax schedule and you wanted to, then maybe you and, and then you're free to change the the, the tax on wealth for some reason in the political process, then you might uh, want to do that. That's why I think, especially when there's disagreements, it's natural. Even if Akis and Sigis were applying, you know, if someone wanted to have had a higher earnings tax or a more progressive earnings tax, didn't get it through the political process, then when it's his time to vote for capital taxes, it's completely reasonable that he, he wants uh, capital taxes. You have to sit at the table together and, and negotiate the package of the nonlinear tax on labor as well as capital to get this kind of result. But the point I want to make is this. Let's put now weight on the children. So I'm going to put expected utility and a weight alpha on the children. And um, when you do the math, that's equivalent to just putting a higher discount factor, uh, so less, patient, less impatience on the future. And is this double counting? Yes. Okay. And I think Fallon convinced me it's the right thing to do, um, as I er said earlier. And, um, and the main result you get from this is as long as you have some weight, then you no longer, access of signal no longer applies. And you do want to distort bequests. Okay. The direction you want to distort it is as follows. You want to subsidize bequests. Kind of a surprising result to some extent if we were out looking for a, cap, a tax on, on bequests. And the tax is progressive, we would say, in the sense that that subsidy falls. So the rich don't get a subsidy, the poor get a subsidy. Uh, one way to think about it is the, pr the marginal tax rate is, is negative, but it's still increasing. Or the tax schedule you could use is convex. Okay, so in that sense, it's progressive, but it's got a negative marginal tax rate. The intuition for this result is you, would, you basically have this alpha that the parents are not taking into account, so you have an externality. And to make parents internalize that externality, you have to put in a subsidy. The reason it's not a constant subsidy is in the usual Pigouvian congestion externality is... It's not total consumption of the future generation that matters, like total pollution matters. It's the, what matters is, is total utility. That means if a rich person saves an extra unit, it doesn't do much for that uh, extra utility as much as if a poor person does. So that's why we subsidize the poor more. But I think a second intuition that's closer to just the economics is, look, uh, here we cared about this equality of opportunity, and a progressive tax is going to make the rich save less, the poor save more, and that's going to tend towards having some mean reversion basically across generations. And that's useful from the point of view of, of equality of opportunity. So we want a little bit of that even though it's a little bit at the cost of incentives. So there's really these two properties, a negative marginal tax rate and a progressive tax rate. So whenever we used to present this, the, you know, a lot of people would like the progressive part because it accords with what they feel that we should have or what we actually have. And it felt strange about the negative marginal tax rate. Our reaction was, well, first of all, maybe sometimes we do have to listen to new ideas, and maybe this negative marginal tax rate is not such a bad idea. I would think politically, if it does do the job of helping uh, reduce inequality, it might be a good sale point to say, instead of thinking of a tax, let's think of a subsidy on the poor. But secondly, when you think of reality, um, there are a bunch of ways in which we are subsidizing the poor's investment in their kids. So in terms of human capital and education, um, and also we don't, you know, it used to be a, you, that you could leave your kid a debt. You can't anymore. So that's a form of like an imposed borrowing constraint that effectively for those parents who are at zero bequests because of that constraint, they have a shadow subsidy basically. Um, so in, in, in shadow terms, there is a subsidy by, by the way we design policy of not allowing your kids to go to a debt prison for, for your own debts. Okay, so, but we still might say, okay, how do we get positive taxes? So I want to review a few ideas we had. Even in this context, if you just say, look, we have this idea of negative marginal tax rates, but people aren't discussing that. It's not for the table. Suppose we only allow you positive marginal tax rates. You might think, okay, then I should just get zero because I'll just iron out your solution. You want a negative, I'll get as close as I can to that. That's zero, okay? But that turns out not to be the case. So as long as... The, the production function is not completely linear. That's not the case. And actually what you get is you do iron out the bottom, so you don't tax them at all, and then you offer a, a, an increasing uh, tax schedule, so it's still progressive but with positive marginal tax rates. So the sort of thing you see in reality, you have an exemption and then positive uh, marginal tax rates. Um, and then 
Another way we, we were thinking you might get uh, positive tax rates and we investigated is there's something missing in this model, which is here the only dimension on which requests vary is because some parents were richer than others. But maybe some parents uh, saved more for their kids than others for the same income. So we wanted to think about that. Um, and this relates to a nice uh, little parable that Mankiw uh, once wrote on his blog, and I think elsewhere. Um, and the idea is, you know, there's two brothers. They end up becoming millionaires on the in with an Internet company. And then one of them just buys sports cars and treats himself to life. And the other brother, you know, saves for his kids and even, you know, his nephews and his grandchildren. And the question is, who, which one of these two millionaires do you want to tax? And if you just consult, you know, who you, you think is more deserving, you might say, you know, the, 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 the guy who's spending on himself, not the one who's saving. Uh, so then a bequest tax has that, that, that odd po property. So we want to write a model with this kind of issue um, and reconcile these two perspectives, the perspective of the children and the perspective of the parents. And think of uh, estate taxation as a balancing act between those two things. So here's the model we wrote down. It's now we're going to assume people have the same income and they just have this taste shock that varies how altruistic they are, theta. The higher theta, more altruistic. And I'm going to abstract from labor hands. And children, um, they just have some utility from consumption. And the welfare criterion is some, some uh, weighted some of the two things. So if we put no weight on kids, uh, we're we're not going to get anything very interesting. So suppose we do put some weight. Sorry about the title. It says no weight. Um, and then, in general, we're going to recover these progressive taxes that we had before, but they're negative. Okay. If, uh, if now we think of a weight on kids that's actually increasing in theta, so those kids um, of, of, of parents that were more altruistic, sorry, decreasing, we, we value them less, then we might... Uh, um, we're also going to get this, this progressivity. Okay? So here's a, a simulation. Um, the left is just constant lambda counts and alpha. You recover the sort of thing we had before. The tax, marginal taxes are negative and increasing. Um, but then th these other cases are playing around with what's going on with lambda. So the purpose of this is to show it kind of depends on the welfare function, which is a bit disappointing, but I guess you just got to say what, what what's true in this model is it does depend a lot on this welfare function we don't know a lot about. Okay. Here's a nice one, though, that maybe sounds right and gives you a very clean result. So suppose you're Rawlsian with respect to children. The, the social welfare function just wants the utility of the, the children to be above some level. Um, this sort of gives you a weight on children that's endogenously decreasing, because if you're above the, the, this threshold, it's going to be zero. And if you're at this threshold, it'll be positive then um, if you have a constant lambda, which seems like a natural benchmark, and you have this Rawlsian criterion, then you get the following uh, is, a, is a tax system that would implement the, the optimum. You have to ban debt, which we do, and then set positive marginal tax rates. Okay? So I show you here just a simulation showing that. You ban debt, so then that's the dotted line. And when, to the left of that, the shadow marginal tax rates eventually become negative. And then to the right, the actual taxes, because you actually have a, a tax schedule there, are positive. Okay. So the takeaway is we can rationalize those features of actual state policy uh, with certain welfare functions, and uh, especially banning negative bequests and, 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 and having a, a positive taxes on bequests. But it is sensitive to the welfare function. You could defend other estate tax systems, and you have to think a little harder about what welfare functions uh, you, you think are, are useful. This mapping between what welfare function would give you this and that, I think is useful to still to think about then, uh, you know, uh, to think about the problem. All right. So now let me jump into another way in which uh, I think it's important to think about uh, the, uh, wealth taxation. And it sort of underlies a lot this uh, Piketty book too, um, which is political economy. So new money, I said, eventually becomes old money. In Exante, we don't want to tax it because this money, this, this wealth was created from labor earnings, Atkins and Stiglitz supplies. But exposed, we're going to find ourselves taking that wealth as given and we'll be tempted to tax it and redistribute it again, the usual time and consistency problem. But thought through the lens more of a redistributional issue than, than you know, pure efficiency in a representative agent world. Now, if you don't have commitment or if you have limited commitment, then saying that you won't tax it is not credible. 
So this basically, uh, what's gonna the problem with that is you're gonna have this fear. If you did that, if, if inequality got too high, of, of a discontent leading to some drastic reforms, maybe the rise in the real world, you know, what I have in mind is maybe you're worried that there'll be a rise in uh, communism or maybe Chavez will come around. Um, and, and so to avoid that, what do you do ex ante? So that's the real question I want to ask. If you're in that situation, what do you do ex ante? So if these trends are there, what should we be thinking now so that the situation doesn't ever get so bad? that maybe then we, we, you know, we overshoot in our reaction later, okay? And so how do we deal with this time inconsistency in redistribution? Um, what policies do we want to set example? And, um, and so the key thing here is the redistribution desires you have exposed depend on inequality, and inequality is a state variable that you get to control somewhat example. So the key insight here is you're going to want to influence that example to not end up in trouble, okay? And so, you know, when we wrote this, I was thinking of this notion of the compassionate conservative. That the reason I'm doing these programs is, you know, because I just don't want uh, things to blow up later or, or, or the demands to get worse, okay? Um, actually, there's some notion that a lot of the welfare programs in Europe were partly a response to the fears of uh, socialism and, and communism. Um, okay, so this is based on uh, Far East Lead, Werning, Yeltikin. Uh, simple model, two periods, much like what I had before. So I'm trying to keep it all very sim similar. Um, and there's, I'm not going to add any weight extra on the future. So that you can think of this as within a lifetime. There's no reason to add a weight in that case. Um, and instead, I'm going to imagine that there will be a reform if, if the utility that people are going to get without reforming isn't high enough relative to the utility they get if they reform. So the right-hand side here is, you know, you get a land reform. Basically, you know, everyone goes out and says, we were supposed to, we had these claims to consume, but we're going to just redistribute, do the Robin Hood thing, and, and we're going to all consume the same, okay, um, because we value equality. And there's some loss in output here that's assumed, it's loss of resources, maybe just from the cost of doing that, et cetera, in a richer model, and we wrote a richer model, it can come from, you know, the reputational cost that that entails. Okay. But the bottom line is there's a trade-off. You would lose some costs, some consumption, but you would get equality. So this um, implies that if you look at the, here I wrote a Lagrangian that includes that. This is just to give you a notion. And you take the first order condition of someone saving a little more, you get the usual term. You trade off today's consumption versus tomorrow, but now you get the two sides of this uh, credibility constraint. And uh, basically, the first term you see here from, coming from the credibility constraint, mu r times u prime c1, that's, um, that's the same as before when we just put more weight on the future generation. So that's going to be pushing for a progressive tax, but that is negative always. Okay? But the other term is of opposite sign, and that's going to help you get a positive tax. Okay? So the interpretation, the, the, the intuition basically is, you know, if someone saves, if a rich person saves, you know, that's just making it more tempting that exposed, we're going to want to do a redistribution. So actually, even though it has a little bit of an extra benefit on the left-hand side, it's much more of a cost on the right-hand side, and we want to put a tax instead of a subsidy. Okay? So the result here is you're going to get both positive and negative, but a progressive tax schedule. Okay? And actually, I, I like doing it this way. We, I recently discovered this way of thinking about it. This constraint can be rewritten so with power utility functions, so that it looks like you're, you're comparing a certainty equivalent of, of, of some uh, distribution of consumption. Here it's not uncertainty. It's just the, 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 the inequality thought of as uncertainty. And there's some certainty equivalent from that. And then divided by expected value. So that number is less than 1. Um, and it's a measure of inequality. The more unequal, the lower that number is going to be. Okay. And we're basically this model saying, you know, you don't want to have inequality too, too, um, too high. Okay. And so basically, another interpretation of the result is extra savings from the poor, that reduces inequality. That's good, so we subsidize it. Extra savings from the rich, that uh, increases inequality. We don't want that, so we, we tax it. Okay. Very simple model gives these kind of answers. Okay, so um, how much time do I have? How much? Oh, okay. Okay. 
I think I've, I've, I've done well then. Okay, so this is returning to this R. Uh, so now I'm going to use this kind of model to think again about R versus G. Okay. So without this political economy, R versus G didn't make it. Okay. Let's see now with this political economy. So let's go back to that model where uh, people save differently because of shocks to their altruism maybe. Um, and so I want to think actually this is a bequest now. And this theta shock is again a shock to your altruism. And we're putting up these preferences that are a little funkier than usual. And they're reverse engineered to have to look similar to warm glow preferences, which are very commonly used in uh, calibrated in, in models of, of, estate tax, of, of estate behavior. Um, and they also have a nice property that you'll see in a minute. We don't know how important that assumption is for, for all of our results, but this is what we adopted here to get the clean results we get. And then the credibility constraint in the law case looks like this, but it's the same notion of the credibility constraint we had before. And I've taken out labor, and now I've made everything an endowment. The reason is then I can control the growth rate more easily. Okay, so I'm just saying there's a growth rate in, in the endowment between parents and children. Okay, and that's the G. Okay, and I'm going to fix R and fix G, just like before. So suppose I only had access to linear taxes. All right? If I had access to linear taxes and with these log preferences, basically... Uh, parents consume a fraction of their income. And income is constant across parents, but uh, that fraction that they consume varies because there's this, this, this preference parameter of theta. And they save the rest. And the kids then get some bequest that varies with this theta, and, uh, and they get the return on it, and then they get their endowment. That's what they consume. Okay, so this is what you get for the allocation. Well, you see here you have an R and you have an I. The I includes a transfer because you're getting these taxes, so you've got to rebate it back. Um, and, 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 and basically you have the, the credibility constraint. So the following is true. If the credibility constraint is binding, it basically pins down these policy parameters. Because if, you're, if you wouldn't make it without taxing, then there's only one way you can make it by setting up these taxes. Okay. Um, so in that case, the tax rate you need is actually increasing in R over G. And the intuition, as you can see here, by taxing more, you reduce the importance of bequests in the consumption of children. And that reduces inequality, okay? Because the bequest here is a source of inequality. And, um, and, and then there's another region, which is if R over G is low enough, then this constraint might not even be binding, okay? And that's because if G is very high, then the, the relative contribution of these two terms the endowment part is bigger, okay? And then the, the constraint won't be binding in there, then over that region, R over G doesn't matter, okay? And we don't need to uh, set the policy parameters this way. So what about if taxes are not restricted to being uh, linear? The linear is nice, but it's a bit mechanical. When you have nonlinear taxes, then now uh, you can satisfy the constraint in many ways, and you can choose how to do them. Actually, so here we weren't able to characterize too much except to say that what you do only depends on R over G. So we've set up the model to have that kind of homogeneity property. So it's not R and G, it's R over G. Then we turn to the computer to see what pattern came out. We found that it depends on R over G in the following way. This is the marginal tax rates as a function of your theta. And you see it has this progressivity property I was, we, we, we were seeing in the earlier models. So that's, that's going through here. It's, it's a similar model, so maybe that's not surprising. Um, but then there's the comparative static, which is new. It's a new thing, which is to think about how R over G affects the tax schedule you want to have. And here you see that it pushes tax, the positive part of the tax rates up and the negative ones down. So it's more like a twist instead of an increase in tax rates. Okay? Um, and basically the intuition is you know, that's going to allow you to get less inequality. But if, if, if R over G is very high, then without changing your tax code, you would get more inequality, now you do this twist to reduce inequality, and that's the best way to do it. So rather in the linear case, you just you know, increase taxes. Here there's the more subtle thing. They become more progressive. Okay. So I'm done. Uh, basically, this was a, a little bit of a review of the models that I think might be relevant for thinking about taxation of wealth, especially uh, wealth that has to do with, with um, at the very top, and it has to do with passing it along generations. Um, the, the sort of old money model, I think, 
with commitment, actually, the, what is believed is that you shouldn't be taxing, but I found that that, uh, that, that result seems a little tenuous. Um, without commitment, maybe even a greater problem, we should be taxing more. I didn't uh, really explore that in those models. The, it, when money is, when we're thinking of, of cr wealth that's created along the way from earnings, um, with commitment, either we shouldn't do anything or we should subsidize, uh, but in a progressive way. Um, but uh, without commitment, we might get taxes, positive taxes that are progressive. Okay? And then the new thing uh, as well is to investigate this R versus G. We see that with commitment, the idea kind of doesn't work. Or it works in reverse, really. Whereas without commitment, again, we do find that R versus G affects the tax rates. You might get higher tax rates or more progressive tax rates. Okay? So I think these ideas deserve careful consideration um, and, and, and more study. This is just a, you know, one, one attempt at, at, at thinking about this more formally. Thank you. Hey, come on over here. Okay, okay. Questions? So if anybody would like to ask something.